Managing Your Emotions Chapter 4 Emotions and the Process of Forgiveness There are two things that cause us to get all knotted up inside. The first is the negative things done to us by others. The second is the negative things we have done to ourselves and others. We have a hard time getting over what others have done to us, and we find it difficult to forget what we have done to ourselves and others. We have been examining how our emotions function, because anything that destroys our confidence in ourselves, or in others, will affect not only us personally but also our relationships with other people. In this chapter we are going to consider what we can expect from our emotions once we begin to learn to operate in forgiveness of ourselves, of others, and of God be quick to forgive. Let all bitterness and indignation and wrath passion, rage, bad temper and resentment anger, animosity and quarreling brawling, clamor, contention and slander evil speaking, abusive or blasphemous language be banished from you, with all malice spite, ill will, or baseness of any kind. And become useful and helpful and kind to one another, tender-hearted compassionate, understanding, loving-hearted, forgiving one another readily and freely, as God in Christ forgave you. Ephesians 4.31,32 The Bible teaches us to forgive readily and freely. We are to be quick to forgive. According to 1 Peter 5, 5 we are to clothe ourselves with the character of Jesus Christ, meaning that we are to be long-suffering, patient, not easily offended, slow to anger, quick to forgive, and filled with mercy. My definition of the word mercy is the ability to look beyond what is done to discover the reason why it was done. Many times people do things even they don't understand themselves, but there is always a reason why people behave as they do. The same is true of us as believers. We are to be merciful and forgiving, just as God in Christ forgives us our wrongdoing, even when we don't understand why we do what we do. Forgive to keep Satan from taking advantage. If you forgive anyone anything, I too forgive that one, and what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sakes in the presence, and with the approval of Christ the Messiah, to keep Satan from getting the advantage over us, for we are not ignorant of his wiles and intentions 2 Corinthians 2 10, 11. The Bible teaches that we are to forgive, in order to keep Satan from getting the advantage over us. So when we forgive others, not only are we doing them a favor, we are doing ourselves an even greater favor. The reason we are doing ourselves such a favor is, because unforgiveness produces in us a root of bitterness that poisons our entire system forgiveness and the root of bitterness exercise foresight, and be on the watch, to look after one another, to see that no one falls back from and fails, to secure God's grace his unmerited favor and spiritual blessing, in order that no root of resentment rancor bitterness, or hatred shoots forth and causes trouble and bitter torment, and the many become contaminated and defiled by it. Hebrews 12, 15 When we are filled with unforgiveness, we are filled with resentment and bitterness. The word bitterness is used to refer to something that is pungent or sharp to the taste. We remember that when the children of Israel were about to be led out of Egypt, they were told by the Lord on the eve of their departure to prepare a Passover meal which included bitter herbs. Why? God wanted them to eat those bitter herbs as a reminder of the bitterness they had experienced in bondage. Bitterness always belongs to bondage. It is said that the bitter herbs the Israelites ate were probably akin to horseradish. If you have ever taken a big bite of horseradish, you know it can cause quite a physical reaction. Bitterness causes precisely the same type of reaction in us spiritually. Not only does it cause us discomfort, but it also causes discomfort to the Holy Spirit, who abides within us. We have seen that we are to be a sweet-smelling fragrance to those who come in contact with us. But when we are filled with bitterness, the aroma we give off is not sweet but bitter. How does bitterness get started? According to the Bible, it grows from root. The King James Version of this verse speaks of a root of bitterness. A root of bitterness always produces the fruit of bitterness. What is the seed from which that root sprouts? Unforgiveness. Bitterness results from the many minor offenses we just won't let go of, the things we rehearse over and over inside of us, until they become blown all out of proportion and grow to monumental size. Besides all the little things we allow to get out of hand, there are the major offenses people commit or have committed against us. 
The longer we allow them to grow and fester, the more powerful they become, and the more they infect our entire being, our personality, our attitude and behavior, our perspective, and our relationships, especially our relationship with God. Let it go, and you shall hallow the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, and if your brother becomes poor beside you, and sells himself to you, you shall not compel him to serve as a bondsman a slave not eligible for redemption, but as a hired servant, and as a temporary resident he shall be with you, he shall serve you till the year of jubilee, and then he shall depart from you, he and his children with him, and shall go back to his own family and return to the possession of his fathers. Leviticus 25 39-41 to keep Satan from getting the advantage over you, forgive. Do yourself a favor and let the offense go. Forgive to keep yourself from being poisoned and imprisoned. According to Webster, the word forgive means to excuse for a fault or offense pardon. To when a person is found guilty of a crime and sentenced to serve a prison term, we say that he owes a debt to society. But if he is pardoned, he is allowed to go his way freely with no restraints upon him. Such a pardon cannot be earned, it must be granted by a higher authority. When someone has offended us, you and I tend to think, that person owes us. For example, a young woman once came through the prayer line in one of our meetings, and told me she had just caught her husband cheating on her. Her response was, He owes me. When someone has hurt us, we react just, as if that individual had stolen something from us, or wounded us physically. We feel that person owes us something. That's why Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Matt 6, 12. In Leviticus 25 we read about the year of Jubilee in which all debts were forgiven, and all debtors were pardoned and set free. When we are in Christ, every day can't be the year of Jubilee. We can say to those who are in debt to us by their mistreatment of us, I forgive you, and release you from your debt. You are free to go. I leave you in God's hands, to let him deal with you, because as long as I'm trying to deal with you, he won't. According to the Bible, we are not to hold people in perpetual debt, just as we ourselves are not to be indebted to anyone else keep out of debt, and owe no man anything, except to love one another, Rom 13, 8. We need to learn to pardon people, to cancel their debts to us. Can you imagine the joy of a person who learns? that he has been pardoned from a 10, 51 or 20 year prison sentence. That's the good news of the cross. Because Jesus paid our debt for us, God can say to us, you don't owe me anything anymore. There is a song that conveys that thought with the words, I owed a debt I could not pay, he paid a debt he did not owe. Our trouble is either we are still trying to pay our debt to the Lord, or else we are still trying to collect our debts from others. Just as God cancelled our debt, and forgave us of it, so we are to cancel the debts of others, and forgive them what they owe us. Let it drop, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him and let it drop leave it, let it go, in order that your Father who is in heaven may also forgive you your own failings, and shortcomings and let them drop. Mark 11, 25 According to the dictionary, forgive also means to renounce anger or resentment against, to absolve from payment to for example, a debt. 3 I like the phrase used by the Amplified Bible in this verse, let it drop. How many times have you had a problem with someone, and think you have settled it between you, but the other person keeps bringing it back up? My husband and I have had those kinds of experiences with each other many times in our shared life. I believe most men are more willing and able to let things go than women. The popular stereotype of the nagging wife is not entirely inaccurate. I know, because I used to be one of them. Dave and I would have a disagreement or problem between us, and he would say, Bo, oh, let's just forget about it. But I would keep dragging it up again and again. I can remember him saying to me in desperation, Joyce, can't we just drop it? That's what Jesus is telling us to do here in this verse. Drop it, leave it, let it go, stop talking about it. But the question is, how do we do that? Receive the Holy Spirit. Then Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. Just as the Father has sent me forth, so I am sending you. And having said this, he breathed on them, and said to them, Receive admit the Holy Spirit. 
Now having received the Holy Spirit, and being led, and directed by Him, if you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven, if you retain the sins of anyone, they are retained. John 2021-23 The number one rule in forgiving sins is to receive the Holy Spirit who provides the strength and ability to forgive. None of us can do that on our own. I believe when Jesus breathed on the disciples and they received the Holy Spirit, they were born again at that moment. The very next thing he said to them was whatever sins they forgave were forgiven, and whatever sins they retained were retained. The forgiving of sins seems to be the first power conferred upon people when they become born again. If that is so, then the forgiving of sins is our first duty as believers. But though we have the power to forgive sins, it is not always easy to forgive sins. Whenever someone does something to me, I need to forgive, I pray, Holy Spirit, breathe on me, and give me the strength to forgive this person. I do that, because my emotions are screaming and yelling, you have hurt me and that's not fair. At that point I have to remember what we have already learned about letting go, and allowing the God of justice to even the score and work out everything in the end. I have to remind myself, that my job is to pray, his job is to pay. When someone does something hurtful to you, go to the Lord, and receive from him the strength, to place your will on the altar and say, Lord, I forgive this person. I lose him, I let him go. Once you have done that, you have to let it drop. It does no good to go through all that then go, to lunch with friends or associates and rehash the whole thing. Why? Because Satan will use it as an opportunity, to nullify your decision to forgive, and rob you of your peace and blessing. Satan W1LL bait you, understand this, my beloved brethren. Let every man be quick to hear any listener, slow to speak, slow to take offense and to get angry. James 1, 19 It is very important to understand, that Satan will bait you even through the mouth of other Christians. Do you know what they will say to you at lunch? So how are you, and so and so getting along? I heard you two were having a little problem. See the tempting bait. Since you are trying to forget it, you may respond, Bo, no harm was intended. But if you are not careful, the others will continue to bait you with questions, drawing you into a conversation about a subject you have determined to drop. I know how gossip works, because in my earlier years I could not walk away from a juicy story. Someone would say something to me about somebody else, and my ears would practically stand out on my head. I would get all excited, Bo, I'm about to learn a secret. That's the kind of thing that poisons us. Now whenever anyone begins to talk about someone else or another ministry, I try to turn the conversation in a totally different direction. I pass it off by saying something like, well, I just pray that God will help that person and ministry to work through their problems and learn something from this experience that will make them more powerful than ever. When someone comes to you to bait you into talking about some problem in your church or ministry, you need to try to turn the conversation by saying, Oh yes, that's right we did have a little problem for a while. But as far as I'm concerned, everything is going to work out fine. If that person insists on asking how things are going, let him know politely but firmly that you are not going to discuss it negatively in any way. Do as the Bible says, and be slow to speak quick to hear, and slow to take offense or get angry. Whenever you hear something that upsets you, and causes you to want to react rashly, stop and think, what's the devil trying to do to me here? What he is probably trying to do, is to nullify their prayer of forgiveness, by baiting you into rehearsing the offense over and over again. What good does it do any of us to tell somebody else how bad we have been hurt? Now I'm not saying we should never share with our spouse or minister or close friend what is happening in our life. But we must preserve a balance here. We must be careful not to destroy someone else's character or reputation. Just because someone has wronged us does not give us the right to wrong that person in return. Two wrongs don't make right. Forgive to keep Satan from getting the advantage over you. Refuse to take the devil's bait. Don't keep rehearsing the offense. If you really want to get over something hurtful, then stop thinking and talking about it. A tone of mercy. And when they came to the place which is called the Skull Latin Calvary, Hebrew Golgotha, there they crucified him, and along with the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. And Jesus prayed, 
Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke 23:33, comma 34. I have shared this example often, but I'm sharing it again because I believe it is a very powerful one. My husband's mother raised eight children almost single-handedly. Today all of those children are serving the Lord. While they were little, she had to clean other people's homes just to make ends meet, because she was not on any kind of government welfare program. All she had to support herself and her family was a small monthly social security check. As the older children grew up, they helped her and the rest of the family. Everyone did what he could to bring in some money. That environment in which Dave grew up would be called poor by today's standards. But all of those children knew they were loved. They were taken to church and taught Christian values and principles. And that upbringing has had a lasting effect upon each of them. In all the years Dave and I have been married, I have never heard him or any of his family members say one downgrading thing about their dad, even though he was the one most responsible for their difficult situation all that time. He was in bondage to alcohol and died when Dave was 16 years old. His family has always presented the issue with a tone of mercy. I believe their forgiving attitude has opened doors of blessing in their lives. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, he prayed for those who were tormenting him, saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You and I need to clothe ourselves with Jesus, to take on his character and personality. We need to quit being so concerned about what others are doing to us, and become more concerned with what they are doing to themselves by the way they are treating us. In the Old Testament, the Lord said to the enemies of his people Israel, Touch not my anointed. 1 Chron 16, 22. Since you and I are children of God, we are his anointed. People place themselves in a dangerous position when they mistreat us, so we need to pray for them. We need to have mercy on them and do as Jesus did, asking God to forgive them because they do not realize what they are doing. Bless, not curse. Now I would like to cite three very important scriptures relating to forgiveness to see if you can detect a common thread in each of them that we often overlook in seeking to be able to forgive someone who has hurt us. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Matthew 5 43 comma 44 Invoke blessings upon and pray for the happiness of those who curse you, implore God's blessing favor upon those who abuse you who are vile, reproach, disparage, and high-handedly misuse you. Luke 6 28 Bless those who persecute you who are cruel in their attitude toward you, bless and do not curse them. Romans 12 14 Do you see what is missing when we just forgive our enemies and go no further? Let me share with you a lesson I learned from ministering on the subject of forgiveness. I once asked the Lord, Father, why is it that people come to our meetings and pray to be able to learn to forgive, yet in just a short time they are right back again still having problems and asking for help. The first thing the Lord told me about such people is this they don't do what I tell them in the Word. You see, although God tells us in His Word to forgive others, He does not stop there. He goes on to instruct us to bless them. In this context, the word bless means to speak well of. So one of our problems is that although we pray and forgive those who have offended us, we turn right around and curse them with our tongues or we rehash the offense again and again with others. That won't work. To work through the process of forgiveness and enjoy the peace we seek, we must do what God has told us to do, which is not only to forgive, but also to bless. One reason we find it so hard to pray for those who have hurt us and mistreated us is that we have a tendency to think we are asking God to bless them physically or materially. The truth is that we are not praying for them to make more money or have more possessions, we are praying for them to be blessed spiritually. What we are doing is asking God to bring truth and revelation to them about their attitude and behavior so they will be willing to repent and be set free from their sins. I know how hard it can be to speak well of people who have done us wrong. Let me give you an example from my own experience. Some time ago we moved into a nice house in a new subdivision. The only problem was that the builder of that house did not follow through with all the repairs he had promised to make. So we ended up having to spend extra time and money fixing up things that should not have been our responsibility. 
but we were determined not to badmouth him. Why? Because we didn't want Satan to get the advantage over us. One evening I saw a young woman out taking her little boy for a walk near our home, so I struck up a conversation with her. Are you enjoying your new house? I asked, trying to be friendly. Oh, yes, she answered, but don't get me started on the builder. Now this was a sweet lady, but I recognized right away that the devil was trying to bait me. How my flesh would have liked to respond, Bo, go right ahead get started. I was so tempted to encourage her to start downgrading the builder. But just then it came to me what to say. Well, I replied, I guess it would be hard to find any builder who would do everything 100% right. That remark turned the entire conversation. It is not enough that we forgive others, we must be careful not to curse them, not to speak evil of them, even if it seems they deserve it. Instead, we must do as Jesus did and bless them, speak well of them. Why? Because in so doing, we bless not only them, but also ourselves. Forgiving others and forgiving self. If we really are living and walking in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have true, unbroken fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses, removes us from all sin and guilt keeps us cleansed from sin in all its forms and manifestations. If we freely admit that we have sinned, and confess our sins, he is faithful and just true to his own nature and promises, and will forgive our sins dismiss. Our lawlessness and continuously cleanse us from all unrighteousness everything, not in conformity to his will and purpose, thought, and action, 1 John 1 7, 9 While we are learning to forgive, we must remember we are to forgive not only others but also ourselves. We must accept and receive the forgiveness we ask God to give us. If we feel that we have done things to cause problems for others, we need to be forgiven, just as much as we need to forgive those who have caused problems for us. If we walk in unforgiveness toward ourselves, we cut ourselves off from fellowship with God, just as surely as when we walk in unforgiveness toward others. We must be just as quick to forgive ourselves of our own sins and failures and weaknesses as we are to forgive those who have wronged us. Otherwise, we will end up in the realm of guilt and condemnation. God wants us to be free so he can have full fellowship with us. But when we are filled with guilt and condemnation, our fellowship with the Father is ruined. The Lord has promised all whom my Father gives, entrusts to me will come to me, and the one who comes to me, I will most certainly not cast out I will never, no never, reject one of them who comes to me John 6, 37. If you have done something wrong, go to the Lord. He has promised to forgive you of your sins, to remove them from you as far as the east is from the west, and to remember them no more. Do you ever forget something important, and cannot remember what it was, no matter how hard you try? That's the way God is about our sins. Once we have acknowledged and confessed them, He forgives us of them, and forgets them, so that He cannot recall them, even if He tries. According to the Bible, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ and Jesus. All things have passed away, and all things have been made new. Rom 8, 1. 2 Cor 5, 17. So why not do yourself a favor, and forgive yourself, just as you forgive others? Forgiving God. Another area in which many people have problems is unforgiveness toward God. Those who have never experienced that feeling, may not understand it. But those who have no what it is to feel animosity toward God, because they blame Him for cheating them out of something important in their lives. Things have not worked out the way they had planned. They figure that God could have changed things, if he had wanted to, but since he didn't they blame him for the situation in which they find themselves. They feel God has disappointed them, and let them down. You may have felt that way at one time or another in your life. If so, you know it is impossible to have fellowship with someone you are mad at. In that case, the only answer is to forgive God. Again, that may sound strange. And, of course, God does not need to be forgiven. But such honesty can't break the bondage and restore the fellowship that has been broken by anger toward the Lord. Often we think we could accept things better if only we knew why they have turned out the way they have. We think if we just knew why certain things have happened to us, we would be satisfied. But the Lord shared with me that we might be much less satisfied if we really knew.
I believe God tells us only what we really need to know, what we are prepared to handle, what will not harm us but will, in fact, help us. Many times we go digging around trying to discover something that God is withholding from us for our own good. That's why we must learn to trust God and not try to figure out everything in life. Sooner or later, we must come to the place where we stop feeling bitter, resentful, and sorry for ourselves. There must come a time when we stop living in the past and asking why. Instead, we must learn to let God turn our scars into stars. Binding and loosing by forgiving. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Matthew 18, 18 KJV. We have not heard enough messages on forgiveness. We need to grow to the point of being quick to forgive, and hearing more on the subject will strengthen us to do so. It is true that you and I have authority as believers, the authority to bind and to loose. We have been taught that truth from Matthew 18, 18. However, if you read the entire 18th chapter of Matthew, you will see that in it Jesus is actually talking about forgiveness. In verse 21 Peter asked Jesus how many times he should forgive his brother who sins against him. In his answer Jesus told the story of the servant who was forgiven by his master of a huge unpayable debt. But then the man went out and demanded immediate payment from another servant who owed him a tiny sum, threatening to have him and his family thrown into jail if he could not pay. The end result was that the evil servant was called in before his master and condemned to debtor's prison because he had refused to forgive someone else, just as he had been forgiven vv 23 34 Then in the last verse Jesus concluded this entire chapter by saying, So also my heavenly Father will deal with every one of you, if you do not freely forgive your brother from your heart as offenses v 35 In verses 15 through 17, just before the verse on binding and loosing, Jesus taught if our brother wrongs us, then we are to go to him privately, and try to settle the matter. If he won't listen, then we are to take to others with us. If he still won't listen, we are to bring the issue before the church. If he still won't listen, then we are to break fellowship with him. But do you realize that all of that is for our brother's sake, and not for our own? All of it. I do believe there is a time when we may have to break fellowship with someone, but it should be for his benefit, and not for ours to help him realize the severity of his wrong behavior, and hopefully, repent and manifest godly behavior. Many times when people have a problem, they won't do anything about it until something like a broken fellowship forces them to assess the situation and take action to set things right. Forgiveness and Restoration Does forgiveness mean restoration? Many people have the mistaken idea that if someone has hurt them and they forgive that person, they will have to go back and suffer through the same hurt all over again. They believe that, in order to forgive, they must enter back into an active relationship with the person who has injured them. That is not true, and this misconception has caused a problem for many people who want to forgive. Forgiveness does not necessarily mean restoration. If the relationship can't be restored, and it is within God's will for it to be restored, then restoration is the best plan. But a broken relationship cannot always be restored. Sometimes it would not even be wise, especially in cases where abuse has been involved. Cleansing the wound. Someone in my early life abused me for a long period of time. I came to hate him. Finally, years later, God sovereignly delivered me from that hatred because I gave it to him and asked him to set me free from it. Although I had forgiven the person and was free of my hatred of him, I still did not want to be around him. Even though we make the decision to forgive someone, it may take a long time before our emotions are healed in that area. God revealed to me that forgiving is like cleaning out the infection in a wound. The Word of God helps us renew our minds concerning how to properly dress an emotional wound. But how deep the scar goes depends a great deal on how well the wound is treated in its initial stages. If a wound is properly cared for from the beginning, the scar left from it will not cause a problem. If it is left unattended, and the infection is allowed to grow and spread, even though the wound is cleaned out and bandaged, a nasty scar may remain that can cause problems later on. The same is true emotionally as well as physically. The best plan is quick and complete forgiveness, 
However, many people don't realize that when they initially get hurt, if a person has not been taught godly principles and guidelines, he reacts in a natural human way, as I did when I was abused. All I knew was hatred for my abuser, and the result was a hard heart, rebellion, and many other problems that have taken years to overcome. It is more difficult to recover if the wound has been deep and left scars. But God promises to bring restoration in our lives, and I know from personal experience that He does what He promises to do if we do what He tells us to do. We can decide to forgive others and refuse to speak evil of them as God's Word instructs us. We can pray for them and ask God to bless them. We can even do all kinds of good deeds for them and show them mercy and grace. Yet we can still feel wounded by them. It takes time for our feelings to catch up with our decisions. Even after a physical wound appears to be healed on the outside, it can still be sore and tender on the inside. It is the same with emotional wounds. For this reason we must be able to distinguish true forgiveness from feelings that are still sore and tender. Forgiveness versus Feelings I believe the greatest deception in the area of forgiveness Satan has perpetuated in the church is the idea that, if a person's feelings have not changed, he has not forgiven. Many people believe this deception. They decide to forgive someone who has harmed them, but the devil convinces them that because they still have the same feelings toward the person, they have not fully forgiven that individual. They go back to square one, and begin praying the same prayer all over again. Oh, God, what's wrong with me? I want to forgive, but I just can't. Help me, Lord. Please help me. In my own case, although I forgave the person who had abused me, and eventually tried to have fellowship with him, he made it clear he did not think he had ever done anything wrong. In fact, he even went so far as to blame me for what happened. I was finally forced to do as Jesus taught in Matthew 18, and cut off fellowship with him, until he came to repentance. It would have been unwise to try to reconcile the relationship, if there was no repentance on his part. Until people repent, they usually do the same things again and again. I knew that I had to protect myself, and that it was not God's will for me to open the door for more abuse. At one point I told him, I want you to know, that I'm through being abused by you. You have controlled me for a long time, but no longer. I love you as someone for whom Jesus died, and I'm willing to go forward with our relationship, but until you acknowledge your sins against me, and repent of them, it is impossible for us to have a proper relationship. Confronting him in this manner, was something I was led to do by the Spirit of God, and it was part of my own healing process. I had been controlled by a spirit of fear, where this person was concerned for many years, and it was time to confront that fear. Does all this mean, that I was filled with bitterness, resentment, and unforgiveness? No, it just means, that I was able to distinguish between my forgiveness and my feelings. I forgave him, because I love God, and want to do what he tells me to do. It took a long time for my feelings, to catch up with my decision, because of the depth of the wound but I had done my part. I had acted on the word of God, and made the decision to forgive. Restration was not possible, yet but forgiveness was. If we do what we can do, God will always do what we cannot do. I could make a decision to obey God, but I could not change how I felt. God did that for me as time went by. Healing takes time. We can cleanse and disinfect the wound. We can bandage it and tend it but we cannot actually heal it. Jesus is the healer. There is a good conclusion to my story. Later God moved in a mighty way to bring deliverance and healing to this relationship. The Lord had been working behind the scenes, and one day the person who had abused me told me he was sorry that what he had done had hurt me. He said that he never intended to hurt me and that, although he had known that what he was doing was wrong, he had never really understood how badly it would affect me. At the time I had already forgiven him from my heart, but this admission of wrongdoing on his part and his willingness to try to do right opened the door for the beginning of restoration in the relationship. It has been slow and not always comfortable, but at least we have been progressively moving forward. I have included this example from my own life to help you realize that just because you will to forgive does not mean that you no longer have any feelings. You may hurt for a long time. 
But the important thing is not to allow the enemy to convince you that, just because your feelings are wounded, you have not done your part before God. Remember, decide to forgive, pray for your enemies, bless and do not curse them. Be good to those who have mistreated you, because you overcome evil with good Siram 12, 21. And wait for God, to take care of your feelings. With the help of God we can learn to manage our emotions, even though they may be tender and hurting. With the power of the Holy Spirit helping us, we can learn not to mistreat those who have hurt us. We can avoid saying unkind things about them to others. We can pray for them. We can wait for God's recompense and see His glory manifested in our lives by choosing to do things His way. Si te gusta este canal, ayúdanos a seguir subiendo audiolibros y suscríbete. Comenta abajo qué libros y de qué autor quisieras que subiéramos. Muchas gracias.